Stay tuned. Ahead, I'll talk with Annie Zaleski about Taylor Swift, the stories behind the songs. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Annie Zaleski is an award-winning music journalist and author based in Cleveland. Her writing has appeared in Rolling Stone, The Guardian, Time, and The Los Angeles Times, and she's written books on artists including Lady Gaga, Pink, Duran Duran, and now Taylor Swift. Annie, welcome to Some Books Considered. Thank you for having me. This book about Taylor Swift is organized by eras, I guess kind of like her eras tour, but maybe a bit different. So tell us a bit about what readers are going to find here. Yeah, I mean, so this is basically um, different blurbs of various lengths talking about, uh, you know, the inspirations behind all of the songs she's written that have been released on her albums. And that includes vault tracks on the Taylor's version records. And also some of her, not B-sides exactly, but non-album tracks. You know, she's written some songs here and there for soundtracks and things like that. So yeah, it's a very, very comprehensive, detailed look at her career at Catalog. Well, to give us a sample of what people are going to find here, I want to ask you to tell us a few stories. And one of them, I'm curious about the story behind her very first single, yeah. Tim McGraw. Yeah, I mean, and this is, uh, you know, the, the, that single is very indicative of sort of her songwriting, um, you know, approach at that stage in her career. You know, she was in class in, in high school. And she basically was, you know, uh, just hanging out, you know, and she was sort of thinking about things going on in her life. You know, so her and her boyfriend were going to break up, you know, she was a freshman, he was a senior. And, you know, and she was thinking about things that reminded her of him. And so and Tim McGraw came to mind, because at that time, she was such a huge country music fan, loved Tim McGraw. And um, her song, she was actually thinking about Can't Tell Me Nothing, the Tim McGraw song. And so so she wrote this really beautiful kind of, you know, heartfelt song um, about that. And so, you know, and at that stage in her career, so much of what was going on in her personal life, whether that was things going on with her friends, uh, things going on in her personal life, things that she wished would happen. Um, those were just really her inspirations at the time. And those sort of inspirations have continued throughout her career. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, she's a v remarkably consistent songwriter, you know, and what I think it's been very interesting when you kind of look at her catalog as it sort of has evolved is that, you know, early on her songs were super, super autobiographical. You could almost draw a straight line between what was going on in her life and the, the resulting music. And you know, as she's gotten older, she's gotten really, really good at kind of using her in these situations as kind of jumping off points to write universal songs. She just, she really has a knack for being both personal and universal at the same time. And that's very, very difficult to do as a songwriter. And she really excels at doing that. Another song I wanted to ask you about and the story behind it is Shake It Off and kind of the oh, yeah. significance of that song in the arc of her career. I mean, Shake It Off was the first single from 1989, which is wi widely seen as, you know, her move uh, completely away from country into the pop realm. And that song is, when you listen to it, you know, it, there's no real country signifiers. It's, um, you know, there's these kind of like, they're kind of like horns, like saxes kind of in it. Um, there's kind of a spoken word bridge in the middle. Like it's very, very, it was a very much a dividing line between her saying, I am going to go straight on pop music. I want to be on pop radio. And, you know, it's basically about, you know, trying to like shake, I mean, not, not no pun intended, but shake off the haters and shake off negativity and just kind of move on with your life and live your life the way you want to do it. And it's, you know, it was a massive, massive success. And I think even now, you know, it's one of those songs that you hear it and it's, it's kind of, it's a ubiquitous song in her career. Well, you've chronicled many songs yeah. for this book, but I'm curious about what might be your favorite story behind a song. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked that. So I think my favorite, one of my favorite Taylor Swift songs in general is The Last Great American Dynasty. And it's actually, it's based on a true story. Um, there is a socialite named Rebecca Harkness. And she actually, like, in a total coincidence, she actually happened to live in Taylor Swift's mansion in Rhode Island that she knows. And Rebecca Harkness has a, like, fantastic life story. She was, you know, she was kind of wrapped up in high society, but she had dreams of being a musician. And what I loved about the songs, because it is a true story, I went digging. You know, Taylor had done a lot of research 
research apparently when she bought the house and um, you know, would talk about her. But I went up and looked at like vintage newspapers and said, you know, what is it? Looked the profiles of Rebecca to really inform this, um, inform the the blurb because she was just this like fantastic figure who would have these lavish parties and you know she had all sorts of just a, a beautiful wild life. And so, um, yeah, that was a joy. I think that's my favorite thing. You mentioned earlier that Shake It Off was, you know, marking a point in her career where she was moving beyond country. Yeah. But a lot of artists that have done that, it doesn't work out so well for them. The, the, the new fans reject them or the old fans get upset. But she has been phenomenal in that area where she keeps changing up things, but it doesn't seem to hurt her. In fact, she seems to gain more fans as a result. It's 100% true. And, you know, I think part of that is that, uh, you know, when you look at her career, she's always been more pop oriented than we realized. You know, I think a lot of her country songs crossed over to the top 40, but she's always had a real knack for pop hooks and chorus hooks and just song construction. And I think it's also because uh, that her songs, her subject matter, you know, is, is grown along with her. And so she's, you know, a lot of her earlier fans have stayed with her and now these fans have kids. And so their kids are getting into Taylor. And so it's one of those things where her music just has a real uh, knack for crossing generations um, because she's writing about things. You know, I think the universal experience of going to high school and, you know, and having been anxious about that, you know, Taylor wrote that when she was a teenager, and you know, modern teenagers now, you know, several decades later are having the same experiences. And so her music has aged very well, too. And because she started out in country music, do you think that's helped her? Because country is kind of known for its storytelling elements. And that's a very strong uh, thing about her music is that ability to conjure up these images and, and tell a story in its song. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, she was such a fan of country music and also songwriters like James Taylor. You know, she's actually named after James Taylor. And so she has, um, you know, she really grew up in these sort of story song, you know, tradition. And, uh, you know, she's a, ma it's, it's when you look at it, when you, you see her, she's a master at writing bridges. You know, when you look at her songs, she has, you know, there's these stories that are unfolding and then she'll have a plot twist basically in the bridge. And, uh, you know, I think that's another hallmark of country music as well. You know, you have this long, this through line that's very consistent and then you make the story go deeper. But yeah, absolutely. I think her love of country music really underpins um, a lot of her songs. I'm talking with Annie Zaleski about Taylor Swift, the stories behind the songs, and our conversation continues in a moment. If you're enjoying this discussion, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you know when I post new interviews. And thank you. As you mentioned earlier, she seems to have this ability to kind of capture what her fans are going through yeah. and, and what the nation's going through. What are some examples from her repertoire do you think really illustrates that? Good question. Um, you know, I think early on, especially, um, you know, I mentioned 15. 15 is a really brilliant song about um, going to high school. And, you know, the as a narrator, you know, she's having a great first date, but her best friend had her heart broken. And so it's a really... Um, you know, it's a, it's a, and then, but then there's in the middle when I mentioned the bridge before, uh, she's, we can tell the perspective shifts and she's older now looking back at everything from that time. And so it's a really interesting song that just really, um, captures what it's like to both be a certain age and then also grow up at a certain point. Um, so that's one thing. I mean, geez, there's just so many different, um, examples of that. I'm trying to think, uh, I, I, there's so many, I can't even, I mean, that one stands out. You know, I think of, um, yeah, there's a song on lover called soon you'll get better. And it's a really heart wrenching song. And it's about her mom. Um, her mom had some health issues in recent years and, um, it's, you know, she kind of alludes to different things that are going on. And like I said, it's wrenching. It is like, I find it difficult to listen to because it's so well done and so sad. And I mean, I think all of us relate to, you know, parents aging, getting older and that mortality, uh, element of life. And so I think that's another one that just really um, speaks to sort of the sophistication and evolution of her songwriting too, that she's willing to kind of put these very difficult things into words. And coming back again a little bit to the, the shake it off mentality, mm -hmm. you know, she's worldwide popular, probably the biggest artist on the planet right now. Yeah. But, you know, she has her critics and I'm sure... Uh, She's human and she, you know, yeah. hears those critics. How, how does she deal with all of that attention? 
You know, I mean, I think part of it is that, uh, you know, she, she's not, I mean, it, it's, there's a lot of artists that, especially now pop artists, there's the pressure to be online all the time and to share your life and to, you know, be present. And, you know, she used to be that way when she was growing up um, very early on, she would have a lot of videos and share a lot about her life. And I think she sort of retreated from the spotlight. You know, I think part of that is also safety, um, you know, because with, with the fame, you know, comes all sorts of, you know, bad potential things happening. And so she's really um, reclaimed her privacy in a way. And so I think that's helped a little bit. And, you know, I think that also that she has just reached a certain point in her career that she doesn't need to worry about, you know, if, if a certain segment of the population doesn't like her, you know, there's, you know, 10 times more people that do like her. And so um, she's very confident in her songwriting and she just kind of follows her muse and realizes this is what I want to do. This is the kind of music I want to be making. And, you know, I am that is the path I should be taking and just not worry about things. But it's hard. I, I could not imagine being at the level of fame that she's at and having every single move of mine scrutinized. Like that's just, it, it's almost hard to fathom. And she talks about that in her music sometimes about yeah. be everything being scrutinized. She's also a brilliant business person. As yeah. Uh, because a lot of artists that have a lot of talent end up, for various reasons, having huge financial problems. and But she has been able to parlay her skills into this massive empire. And what can you tell us about her business skills? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, among other things, she re-recorded her albums. You know, they're called the Taylor's Version albums. And she did that basically after... Um, her early records or her early, basically she doesn't own, uh, you know, she doesn't have control over them due to the record contract she signed at the time. And so she basically decided, no, my songs mean so much to me. I'm going to re-record them and re-release them. So I own this music then. And so she basically sort of reclaimed her, uh, you know, her creativity, reclaimed her life's work and it's been massively successful. You know, I think those, the new versions have sort of superseded the older ones in terms of popularity and, you know, in terms of in pop culture as well. And so um, it was a really brilliant move. And no one's ever done that before. You know, I mean, there have been artists who have kind of re-recorded different songs and albums, but not on this level and not on the scale and not to this level of success. So it's, uh, you know, I think it succeeded beyond her wildest dreams, no pun intended. <laughs> well, we have to talk about the Eras Tour because it is a phenomenon, I mean, yeah. when she, wherever she brings her to her, it brings millions and millions of dollars into the economy of that city and the surrounding yeah. area. And it just keeps going and going. Why do you think it has been so successful? I mean, I think just the, as you kind of said, the sheer scale of it. I mean, the amount of, you know, she's basically Bruce Springsteen in terms of these, the, the concert lengths she's doing, you know, well over three hours covering all eras of her music career. You know, I think the staging as well is just like the stage is massive and just unbelievable. The choreography is something else. You know, her dancers have their own personalities that are really um, have their own followings as well, especially on TikTok. And, you know, I think the fact that she's just really, um, recognizing and celebrating everything she's ever done. I think also, you know, there's a little something for everyone in the show and it's an experience. You know, you go up and you share friendship bracelets, you know, you hang out with friends, maybe you hang out with your mom or your dad. And so it's, um, you know, it's not just a concert. It's something much bigger than that. Well, you've covered a lot of artists and, you know, examined a lot of different careers in music. What are your thoughts about the future for Taylor? You know, it's hard to say. Um, you know, I, I feel like the Tortured Poets Department, her most recent record was sort of a chapter closing on, you know, she's sort of on, you know, everything she's been doing so far. So I, you know, I think she's going to release the Reputation Taylor's version, which she's been kind of talking about. Um, I would love to see her do like an acoustic record. I would love to see her kind of dig into her vault and maybe revisit some of her earliest songs and see what an older Taylor could do with them. Um, but I would love to see her do a rock record. Honestly, I think she's always kind of hinted at that and I think she could do you know she's a great guitarist I think she could do a really dynamic record too so the sky's the limit the book is Taylor Swift the stories behind the songs by Annie Zaleski Annie thank you for talking with me today thanks for having me 
If you'd like to purchase Taylor Swift, the stories behind the songs, I've placed a link for you in the description below. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you know when I post new interviews. Meanwhile, here are two more interviews you might find interesting. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.